What? I'm live? How's it going? Uh, ZPAC, we have a really special guest today. Yesterday we did a show about direct primary care, this new model of primary care where we take the insurance company out of primary care and go directly to the patients. Today we have Dr. Eric Kral, who actually has built a very similar model and can get into the weeds about it. Because many people ask me, how do I build Health 3.0 ZDog as a patient? How do I get the care that I used to get back in the you know, 20th century where my doctor spent time with me? Doctors are saying, how do we stop having this moral injury of serving an insurance company and a computer instead of our patients and ourselves? And the answer, I think firmly, is direct primary care, which we're gonna talk about today with our guest, Dr. Eric Kral. Welcome, Eric. Thank you. Eric, you're a family doctor? I am a family physician. In Tampa? Yes. And you have a practice that uses this model? Correct. And you, you, we connected through Hint Health, which was the tech and service company that helped me run Turntable Health. It helped me do a direct primary care practice in the form of managing the patients, making sure I kept track of everything, creating an ecosystem where I could learn from other doctors doing this. Because we need to change. It's not just tweaking, polishing the turd. Let's fix primary care. No, 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 no. We need to absolutely blow it up and rebuild it the way it should be. And I think you are one of the people on the front lines of doing that. And so a question for you. Let's start with this. How did you get into changing your practice to a direct primary care model? Well, let me be clear. I'm an early adopter of the direct primary care model. There were many brave souls that went before me who are known to be the innovators. Garrison Bliss. Absolutely. Yeah. In fact, his, his niece Erica is one of the ones who I credit with getting me into the direct primary care space. She got me into it too. How about that? So she's a lovely uh, human being and was so passionate about not letting anybody get in the way of her and her patients. So yes. that, that was sort of your intro to it as well. It was 2009, before the Affordable Care Act, where I first learned about it, and I just filed it away. I was very happy in my employed uh, practice. Um, Employed I, practice. Oh, oh yeah, I was hired uh, an employee of a hospital. So oh, 17 so years as an employee, just like most of the docs out there. Are you more machine than man now, twisted and evil? Call me Mr. Origato. <laughs> yeah. that, that was Sticks, right? Yes. I am the modern man. Oh. Secret, secret. I've, I've got, got a secret. <laughs> <laughs> With parts made in. Okay, back. Focus. <laughs> Focus, see that. So, you were in this system for 17 years as an employed physician of yes. a hospital. Tell me more about this. So I know the old way, now I'm doing it the new way. Uh, fortunately, I was exposed early enough, as I said, 2009. I filed it away that if the status quo ever was bad enough, that's something that I would love to do. But what the Affordable Care Act did was it, it, it got people used to paying their own, paying out of their pocket for services. Because all of a sudden everybody says, well, we have these high deductibles. My insurance isn't paying for anything anyway. Yeah. So I saw that, well, the high deductibles going up every year, there's gonna be more and more people who are gonna find value in a membership-based practice. So 2013, the, we'll get into it more, I'm sure, but after a few years, things did get bad enough, and I just made the jump in 2014, and I, I just made the jump cleanly. I dropped all insurances, dropped Medicare, and became a direct primary care physician so that I could work only for my patients, not for the insurance companies. So you effectively unplugged from the matrix. That's how I like to consider it, because I was exactly. in the same boat, employed Correct. physician, and when you unplug, you go, okay, everything is broken. I and mean, we talk about this on the show all the time. I don't need to rehash why, it, you know, with the Affordable Care Act, yeah, you have to spend all this deductible until the insurance actually kicks in. And it's dumb anyways, because insurance shouldn't be for your oil change and your preventative care. It should be for when stuff goes really wrong. Correct. And so this idea that then you said, okay, I can't do this anymore. So a lot of doctors, a lot of doctors can't do this anymore, but, they don't know they have a better way. They don't know they have a better way. Self-deception is a huge thing. I did it for years in my practice where I told myself lies. If I can just work another 10 years and survive and out, outlast this, then maybe I can find another thing that I can do or go into administration or yeah. do something like that. But it's a lie because every day you're suffering this moral injury 
having to work in a system that is the matrix and there's agents running it that have no interest for patients. They have interest for profit. So when you unplugged, how, what was it, how did you spin up what we, what we call direct primary care, which is flat membership fee for an, sort of an all-you-can-treat buffet of care? Yeah. How, how did you do that? Well, all employed physicians have a non-compete typically where if they're going to leave their employer, they have to go 10 miles away. That's so and dumb, so, by the way. It is. Yeah. So all I had to do was pick a day and say, okay, I'm going to go 10.2 miles away, which is what I did. <laughs> and I made sure, since I knew a year or so ahead that I was going to do it, that basically all my patients' prescription refills came due like in the same month so that I wasn't allowed to call them and tell them I was leaving, but all my patients knew the month after I left that I was gone because they had to call the office for their refills. Right. And uh, so literally it just went 10.2 miles away, opened the office, opted out of Medicare so that, and it's funny, you opt out of Medicare because you love to take care of your Medicare patients. It's not that you're, you're shunning Medicare. I wanted to be able to take care of my Medicare patients and so opting out allowed me to have a monthly membership-based uh, relationship with them. Let me so, unpack that, because yeah. we talked a little bit about that yesterday with Dr. John Bender. Our staff at Turntable didn't opt out, and the reason is they were young doctors, and the concern was if, for whatever reason, our experiment failed, which ultimately did after three years, for reasons we'll talk about, they couldn't, if you opt out of Medicare, you can't see Medicare patients for right. at least two years. Now, what, you're, what we need to clarify for people, especially doctors who are thinking of making this jump, Medicare will not allow you to stay on the Medicare, bill Medicare in any way for any patient if you're, if you're ever charging a Medicare patient a membership fee because they consider it some kind of double charge. Correct. It's incorrect, but it was a law designed to protect seniors. But now, it's fallen behind the times because now in order to, to charge a membership fee, you have to tell Medicare, I will not bill you for anything directly to Medicare for at least two years. And that's okay. If your goal is to be straight direct primary care and only work for your patients, you're fine to opt out of Medicare. But weren't you terrified doing that? Because what if it failed and you had to go back to your employed physician and now you can't, you, they can't, you can't bill a Medicare patient? And therein lies the rub. See, the reason that physicians are afraid, and your example at Turntable, was they're afraid that their practice may not remain financially viable. So they need to be able to moonlight in emergency rooms and do other things to get income. So they're afraid to let Medicare go. Uh -huh. The new model is going to be based on networks forming around the country, bringing the direct primary care benefit to employers. And so as in all these employees are looking to have a direct primary care doctor, there's going to be this huge pool of, of patients for direct primary care doctors to now take on. So these networks are going to form, they already are by the way, to bring employers and doctors who are providing the direct primary care service together so that a DPC doc can open up a practice and within a year be 75% full, maybe completely full within a year. So there's no need to be worried going into it that it's going to be, it's not going to be viable financially and they can just let it go, make a clean break, have no third party payers whatsoever um, other than the employer in, in that which, which is really a first-party player. Yes. Because the employer is paying the health care for their employees directly. We talked about this yesterday. And as such, their skin is in the game. They want their employees to be healthy at a good cost. Yes. And all the insurance company is, when it comes to primary care in that situation, is a parasite. All they're doing is racking up administrative costs, refusing claims, and making us, here's the worst part, making us jump through hoops before we can actually get paid for our services. If you throw them out of primary care, which I said in my TED talk in 2013, and I got hate mail from insurance companies, it, like threats, I said, insurance has no place in primary care if it's billing a fee for service. It has no, it has no place. And so you get them out, you directly contract through networks with employers. Employers pay for your primary care services with a flat fee or however it is, and then you keep their employees out of trouble. And if you fail, then the employer provides the catastrophic coverage 
that covers hospitalization, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But what about like labs and imaging and those kind of things? How, how do you manage those? Well, as we talked about earlier, the ecosystem that Hint is developing, the entire ecosystem around direct primary care is developed now, where you can get labs done for a cash price for pennies on the dollar. You can get an x-ray for 30 bucks. You can get an MRI without contrast for 250 bucks. That is the, now that there's a cash market, these services are readily available. This isn't some special pricing for Dr. Crawl. Anybody who knows about it can go get an MRI for $250. And you know, the medicines through you know, GoodRx and these other platforms that are allowing people to get discounted uh, medications, those are readily available. I mean, there's no reason to pay. You, 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 l l l so, okay, first of all, you guys should know Hint, uh, we're gonna, we tag this Hint sponsoring the show. And the reason I agree to work with Hint, because I hate sponsors, you know that, right? It makes me violent when I have to consider a sponsorship because if there's any conflict, if it's something I don't like, I just can't do it. But with Hint, they ran our practice. They helped us make these networks and that sort of thing. And now they've learned so much and grown their network so big that I think the world needs to know. If you go to Hint.com, you can learn about direct primary care. You can connect with their experts. Right. There's a community there. What you said about paying for these tests. Now, I will tell you there will be comments. I'm looking through the comments. There will be people who say, now, wait a minute. So you're telling me I have to pay for insurance and this membership fee of, how much is your membership fee? $60 a month 60 for bucks adults. A month. 60 bucks a month, okay. Mm -hmm. So for adults, less for children? 50. 50 for kids. So Family I'm, max of 150. Family max of 150. Very so important. You, so if, you're, if you have uh, 30 children and you're a Catholic or Mormon, <laughs> you get a deal. Basically, yeah. so well, I'm not here to talk about my practice, so that's okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But uh, so at that price, people say, "Well, now I have to pay extra," and then you're telling me, "But the tests, I could get cash tests, but my insurance would cover that, right?" Wrong. Your deductible, if you're a family, could be as high as sixty-five hundred dollars. I'm, I'm busting at the seams tell to me, respond to tell that. Tell me. One of my favorite things in life to do is talk to a group of really smart people. Usually, it's or it could be CFOs, CEOs. Could it be and, Tad? I uh, haven't met Tad, it could he's, be though. He's really smart. <laughs> anyway, sorry, go on. And <laughs> it's to ask them the question, what do you think is the number one driver in rising healthcare costs today? And I love asking smart people that question because they always say the same things. Oh, well, it's technology, it's, it's doctors are afraid of being sued. It's, you know, there's a lot pharma. of reasons that they always get pharma, tech, you know. And all the answers they give are correct. But there's a, a gentleman by the name of David Goldhill who made an inspiring talk at one of the direct primary care conferences a few years ago and gave an elegant description over an hour about why the number one driver of health care cost in this country is simply the fact that we use insurance in ways it was never intended mm. to be used. So it's abuse of insurance that has led to the cost. So that all these claims that are being generated for predictable everyday expenses that people could just be paying out of their pocket for, it's all that administrative cost of all those claims that is responsible for cost. So, as I said, the Affordable Care Act, it got us used to the idea that we're paying out of our pocket for health healthcare services. So the lightning bulb goes off. What does the healthcare system look like in the future? It's getting back to using health insurance the way it was intended to be used, which is only for unpredictable high ticket items that, you, that, would, that would break you financially if they occurred, and then paying for all of your predictable expenses out of your pocket. And that's where direct primary care comes in because it's just a low fixed monthly cost like a gym membership. And then hopefully you'll have you know, tax deferred money in HSA accounts or whatever where you can go buy your labs, your x-rays, but you're just paying for all that out of your pocket. You wouldn't want that to go through an insurance company because the insurance company, the insurance costs skyrocket because of all those claims. So we want to be paying for our healthcare services by ourselves. That's what keeps the cost down because now x-ray facilities, labs, they all have to compete with each other for your healthcare dollar. Okay, you and I agree 100%. Here's what the contrary opinion will be, and this is what people will say. But, 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 as it is, I can't afford health care. You're asking me to take this into my own hands. But as it is, wait, but it sh insurance should cover that, and the government should pay 
for insurance for everyone in terms of Medicare for all, and then we'd all be covered and we'd control costs because the government wouldn't let you do certain procedures. What do you say to that? Well, hopefully all of the lobbyists for the insurance industry will, you know, will be handled in such a way that the, the government can change the IRS laws, that they can change the way HSA accounts are done. Because if everybody could have an HSA that has 5,000 bucks in it, mm -hmm. and family members could share their HSA accounts, yeah, which so you, that yeah. each family could be like its own insurance company where you're helping each other pay for expenses through your HSA accounts. I mean, if the government took everybody who's on Medicare and Medicaid and gave them all five grand in an HSA, from what I understand, they would save money than rather having to pay all those claims that come through. But heaven but forbid we have people manage their own care and money. But, but so, okay, okay, okay. This, 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 this is important. Yeah. This is not a conservative thing. This is not a liberal thing. It's not no. a libertarian thing. This is useless. This well, is just <laughs> plain common sense. It is. Right now, all right? There's a $6,000 deductible. Now, what if you could instead put that $6,000 in a health savings account or a, a some kind of, I don't like health savings account because it has a political tinge to it. Oh, yeah. I like something like just a, a savings account that then grows tax-free and if you, and you should be able to use that money to spend on primary care as a membership. So now you have unlimited, all you can treat access Correct. to amazing, reconnected, relationship-driven, team-based, technology-enabled care Yes. Where the doctor spends time with you, where we reconnect to our love of why we went in this in the first place. Correct. You love your patients. Your patients love you. We can fight like family members and punch each other and yell and scream, but we deeply love each other because we live in the same neighborhood and we care. And no insurance person shows up to say, these are the boxes you click so we can be the middleman. The patient isn't your customer. We're your customer, the insurance company. So here's, here's how I see it, and then you tell me where I'm wrong. Let the government fund those savings accounts for people who are on Medicaid and Medicare. Let them then provide either, let, let insurance companies that currently exist provide the catastrophic wraparound coverage. Their due place. Their That's, due place. We need them for that. Why wouldn't insurance companies want to be insurance companies? I don't think they want to be in primary care. They just don't, you know, again, it, it, it's complicated because I've talked to these companies. And I've spoken internally for these companies where I've told them, here's what we did at Turntable Health. We took you all out of the equation. So how about this? How about you guys actually pay the membership fees for some of your high risk patients and watch what happens? Because you're gonna, all the rest of those downstream costs are gonna drop. Because where does the healing and prevention happen? It's here. Right. Yeah. So, so now what you're doing is you're actually working with Hint and others to build networks that then directly negotiate with employers to push out all the crap Yes. And how's that been working? Uh, ironically, just yesterday, met with a company with 350 employees. And so they, they are self-funded. You kind of went into that yesterday yes. and explained it a little bit. So that company is paying all their own claims, mm. but they have um, a major third-party payer that makes it so complex that they're not allowed to shop for that $250 MRI. They have to pay a it's a $1,500 MRI that's discounted to 1,000, mm. but if only they could shop it on their own, they could pay 250. So anyway, this self-funded employer says, we love the direct primary care model. We want our employees to be able to select a direct primary care physician, and then they switch the type of insurance they have. It's self-funded, but they go to a different payer that unbundles it all so that they no longer have to follow a specific network with specific pricing and they can get the best price for meds, they can get the best price for, for uh, you know, consultants, they can shop everything. So they are in control of all their supply chain costs and dun, da, 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 all their employees get a personal relationship with a physician that they can see whenever they want, as often as they want to, by video, by text, that is Health 3.0 that you've been talking about. And like you said yesterday, it is happening. This is not some dream that, that we know we can get to. It's happening. Man, I'm gonna, I'm gonna weep hearing this because this is what we've been trying to work for for all these days and years, right? And, and the thing is, when you say that we're at a tipping point when this is happening, 
I can tell you, I have never seen it so close. I'm supposed to speak for the Healthcare Administrators Association, HCAA, in like uh, January, February, March, something in Vegas. And I saw this and I'm like, wait, who are these guys? I got on a phone call with them. They, are the, they represent the third party administrators that you talked about that are creating these plans for self-funded employers. And they told me they wanted me to speak because they believe that the future is these sort of unique unbundled plans with DPC, direct primary care, at the core. This is the organization that represents these payers, these third party payers. Like if that doesn't get you excited, like the stodgiest people, yeah, the, the future is right around the corner. That's how close we are. But it takes people like you who are up on the front in 2013, who are running out there taking arrows in their back as pioneers, right? Who are, who are having the sleepless nights and, and, and setting it up. So we deeply appreciate that. I know because I went through it. I went from complaining about administrators to becoming an administrator <laughs> in my own clinic. And now I just feel sorry, I feel bad for administrators because their job, it's a kind of a moral injury itself. You have to serve multiple masters. You want to serve the patient, you want to serve your, your doctors and your staff, and then you have to serve the organization and the finances. Right. And in a system where doing good for your patient means doing poorly financially, that's a disaster. It is. But what you're setting up and what Direct Primary Care is doing, and again, I'm going to pitch our sponsor, companies like Hand, they're enabling doctors who aren't necessarily innate entrepreneurs, they're not accountants, they're not people who are like really good at like acquiring patients and being salesmen and this kind of thing. They will manage that on a back end with software that will help free you to then do this. Exactly. And that now, you've worked with them for a while, has it been good? Uh, I couldn't imagine doing direct primary care without Hint, um, especially getting into the direct to employer space because right. it's the, the ecosystem that matters. It's the fact that I have a platform that allows me to communicate with my patients very elegantly and securely and it integrates with Hint. The yeah. electronic records that direct primary care docs use are very low cost. It's a very low overhead to go into a direct primary care practice. It's all integrated through Hint. Isn't it low cost? It's low cost because you're not doing billing. Correct. <laughs> You're not going, well, did I document the level five visit with a 12-point 12, 12 review of systems that I didn't do, right. but, I, but I've clicked the box that says it's negative, yeah. right? If, the current system forces us to become liars just to get through our day. We click boxes, we ask questions of pregnant women like, how's your prostate? And it's just dumb. Here's a great comment uh, Elisa Leilani makes. If you put every car claim through insurance, your premium would skyrocket. Paying for health care makes sense. It's exactly that. What, what if McDonald's was covered by insurance? First of all, you'd go into line and you'd, have to, you'd only be able to get those items that are covered. Mm -hmm. And if it was done the way we do medicine now, it would be some person like a doctor telling you what item you're going to have and then running it through the process. The line would be out the door. Costs would skyrocket because there's a, there's a space between you and the real cost. Yeah. That, that would be shunted to employers and then to the government and ultimately to who? To the patient. Because the patient is paying higher premiums and all of that. By doing this, we can drop costs and actually improve outcomes. But more importantly for me, in my mind, save our profession. Exactly. That, yeah, that's the third piece. It's like everybody wins when this happens. Individuals, families, employers, physicians for actually getting back to what they went to med school to do, take care of the patient. I mean, nothing will save a physician from burnout or opening up a bait and tackle shop down in the Keys instead of practicing medicine than transitioning their practice to a direct primary care model. I mean, that's where you rediscover the joy in practicing medicine. I've almost never heard a doctor who switched to DPC who's come back and gone, I really regret that. They all say, I was awakened, I unplugged from the matrix, I rediscovered joy, it's hard. And I think the, the hardest thing is getting patients into the practice. Correct. Because the perception is, I'm paying extra for this? No, 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 no. You're actually gonna save money, but the problem is, and this is the problem with turntable, we didn't have the surrounding infrastructure and ecosystem. Yes, right? exactly. So, okay, here's the thing, turntable, pay us 80 bucks a month, because we had a big team, and we specialized in chronic disease, et cetera. So that was our price point. I think even that might have been a little low for what we did because our overhead was too high. Uh, come past this, but you're going to need wraparound insurance because, you know, and that insurance ain't cheap because they don't carve out primary care. Yes, you're double paying now. You're yes. double paying. Right. You're paying the insurance company to cover you with 
Shardy. I almost said the S word, but this is a sponsored show. I'm going to say Shardy. Really Shardy primary care. And the, 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 you have to click boxes. You see the guy for five minutes. They're, you're paying for that in your premium. Yes. But then you're extra paying us. Now, what if this? What if you unbundle that? That's what you said. Unbundle the primary care, and you now get to choose who your primary care doc is. Because there's no network. It's whoever you, you work for whoever you want. You know. So what, what does that mean? It means that if you suck, Dr. Crawl, that patient's going to walk. Yeah, the people who are critical about DPC, um, they say, well, we like primary care in the DP, in the 2.0 space where we can regulate it and control it. We don't want primary care to go back to 1.0. You don't have to regulate it because it's a it's free space. If you don't give do a good job of providing service, your patients will go somewhere else. Bingo. So you, Bingo. Yeah. That's it. Our patients were, you know, I'll tell you, so our biggest source of patients ultimately because we solved this problem was Nevada Health Co-op, which was the not-for-profit co-op. Yeah. They said, we're a new company funded with Ob Obamacare loans. We're going to experiment. We're going to pay you guys, you know, 75 or whatever the per patient per month was, and you're going to do our primary care turntable, and we're going to call it the turntable plan, and we're going to put it on the exchange, and we're going to provide the wraparound insurance, and it's going to be a cheaper plan because they are, the patients who pick that plan know that they can only use you as their primary care. So this was a kind of coercive model. Yeah. But the patients knew going in, okay, this is what I want. And we saved money for them. We reduced claims. They had great uh, seamless coverage, and they went out of business for reasons unrelated to us. And at that point, these 3,000 patients that were reliant on us, we had to find them doctors in this 1.0, 2.0 mess that is Las Vegas. And that was heartbreaking for us because we're like, they were getting this amazing care with government subsidies to help them pay for the insurance. And it, it, this is the model. We were too early. And, and so what I see what you guys are doing with Hint, Hint, with Hint, you can disintermediate insurance entirely. Completely, like a gym membership. Like a gym membership. That's it. And then this is the thing like, and so you know, people who can't afford it will say, well, I can't afford it. Well, that's great. When you get it right, the government can subsidize your fees. They can fill up your personal savings account and you can then choose your doctor who you're gonna give that money to, right? right? You can even make the choice, I don't want a doctor and I don't wanna take care of myself. That's your choice, but you'll pay the consequences in terms of your health outcomes. And it's ironic that the actual cost is so low that we, we use the monthly gym membership as an as a analogy, but the cost of having your own personal physician is the same roughly on the order of a gym membership, of a, a grooming fee monthly to have your dog groomed, mm. the s average cell phone bill. I mean, these are things that people prioritize. Yeah. And now, because the cost of direct primary care is so low, they can have their own personal accessible physician for the same cost as all these other things that they currently budget into their monthly expenses. So, you know, Christy Seitz asked a question that I think there's a lot of confusion, right? Because it's hard to communicate this easily. Well, wh how would this work if you get sick on vacation and you had to go to the hospital? So what happens to your patients if they go on vacation? Oh, well, I, I formed a network. This is in Tampa Bay, but I formed a network with other physicians, so we cover for each other. I mean, today I'm here seeing you. If any of my patients needs to be seen, there are two doctors within five miles of my practice that'll see them, and they don't have to pay. It's all a, agree. It's a, a contractual agreement. What if uh, Christy goes to California, gets an appendicitis? How is that paid for? Well, hopefully she has a truly catastrophic insurance plan or a cost-sharing plan, something similar. L to Liberty to, and one of these. Right, yeah. exactly, mm -hmm. MediShare. But we encourage all of our patients to have that for a catastrophic. We just want them to only have insurance that covers catastrophes and do everything else directly. So you get hit, you get your you crash your car into a wall, that's car insurance. Oh, yes. You need to prevent the car from leaking oil, that's that's what you guys it's do. out of your budget. You plan ahead for it. You know it's going to be there every three months. You're going to have to do it. You plan it. Christie's confusion was common in our patients at turntable. But what happens if I get really sick? That's what your insurance is for. What happens if I'm uh, somewhere else and I get sick? Well, we're going to call that hospital. You're going to call us because we have a relationship. You have my cell phone number. Yes, you're of gonna, course. You're going to call me and go, I'm in the ER in California with right lower quadrant pain. They're not going to say that. They're going to say, it hurts, my tum-tum. 
And you're gonna say, okay, let me talk to your hospitalist. Hi, I'm her doctor. This is the things you need to know about her. She gets very anxious if you put her in confined spaces. Make sure to pre-medicate her. Also, I want you to call me and fax me that discharge summary the minute you know what's going on. And she and I are gonna be in cahoots, so you better communicate with me. That's freaking care. We are our patients' advocates getting through the maze of the healthcare system. So when our patients need services elsewhere, we are their advocates. So we stay involved in the process. How's that different than concierge medicine? People be like, this is for rich oh, people. Thank you for asking. Uh, that's one of my favorite questions. So the biggest difference between DPC and concierge is that we, we all are looking for a way to free ourselves from the administrative burden of insurance. Mm. Concierge physicians continue to bill insurance. Yes, they do. They narrow their panel to two or 300 and charge an access fee so they can keep the doors open but they still deal with all the burdens of billing insurance. Direct primary care doctors just get rid of insurance completely, and so we can offer fees on the order of $60 a month rather than $1,500 to $2,500 a year. It's the same personalized service, just a lower cost because we eliminated the cost of billing insurance. Concierge for the masses is what I like to consider a DPC. It's like you get this, you get your own doctor who knows you, you get all the time you need with that doctor, you, and, new ways of communicating. Actually, before I ask you about that, I want to read Debbie, Debbie Danish's okay. uh, comment because she's a supporter of the show and a subscriber. And also, she has the name Debbie Danish, which is the dopest alliterative name I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> uh, she says, I'm here and I'm a 3.0 supporter. My guidance practice is sending out letters this month, letting everyone know that they are going to start practicing the way they want to. Unplug from the matrix, right? Take care of patients. Um, now, unique ways to communicate with our patients. They're not paid for by insurance, but in direct primary care. You're just, your patients are paying you to manage their care and everything's included. So you're, it doesn't, you don't worry about whether you're gonna get paid to do this video visit or, it, you, they're just paying you to manage their care and that encompasses everything. So yesterday, John Bender showed up and we didn't get to show this on the show. He had an app, he has a robot, a Beam robot in his clinic and he can drive the damn robot from his app and talk to patients when he's here. So he was there walking through his clinic and his staff was like, hey z Dog," And I could see them. <laughs> that is unique, innovative technology that allows you to have a face-to-face -face with your patient. Insurance ain't gonna pay for that. No. But you don't even have to think about it because your goal is take care of the dang patient in a way that helps them. That's what I love. I never think about cost whatsoever. It never, it never enters the equation. If I have a patient comes in and I'm removing a mole, I'm not thinking, gosh, I. I wish there was back in the day where I could get 300 bucks for removing this mole. I don't worry about cost, I never think of it. And that's the beauty of DPC. Everybody pays every month, whether they come in or not. And so that allows the cost to be low per person. Yeah, because you're subsidizing, it's a big pool of risk. And so that means you can spend more time with your chronic disease patient. You can spend more time. Yeah, Bender does sub Suboxone and treats opioid addiction. Yes. Mm -hmm. You can do that if you choose to do that, if that's an interest of yours. And you're diabetic, you know, they, you, they can come in every week and go over their sugars. They can come in every month and you know, go over what they're doing to lose weight. They're not paying anything, no matter how often they come in. So you can manage them. Can they, can they just text you and be like, here's my sugars? Oh yes. Can they share their Apple Watch data with you? Absolutely. So, and, and so when they go into AFib and they get all scared, <laughs> Dude, I saw that you episode. See that one? Yeah, man, I'm terrified of that. It's great. It's great that that we're democratizing health information. It's bad that we don't know what to do with it yet. And oh, and that, and that gets me to a thing. Actually, I want to ask you this. Okay. It's important. What's to stop you from overordering tests that you're not paying for, and what's to stop you from overtreating and driving up systems costs? Well, first of all, we have personal relationships with our patients. We're not afraid of being sued by our patients. They're not gonna sue us. They know that we are concerned about them. So you're no longer ordering tests just because you feel like you need to cover yourself. Mm. So that's one thing. Um, number two, all we care about is what the patient needs. Mm. We're not serving a third party payer. So if they need a test, we order it, but we're not gonna order something just because you know, it has to be done. But the, th the most important answer to that question is, we have the time to figure things out and get to the root causes of problems mm -hmm. without having to just shift them off. So if you come in, to, you, you have a headache, I mean, I can spend an hour with you and talk about stress, talk about your diet, all the things that are going on. I can formulate a likely diagnosis, prescribe a treatment plan and see you back, call you the next day, call you next week, and lo and behold, your headache gets better. 
MRI saved. You don't need that MRI. And I don't need to send you to a specialist if you have heartburn um, as long as, you know, I mean, you know, you get, get to root cause, you talk about diet, you spend time with the patient and talk to them. You don't need to send them for specialty visits and tests. I'm guessing you also wouldn't just start people on narcotics to get them out of your office. Well, no, they might have some depression, which is exaggerating their response to their pain, and maybe we need to talk about that. Oh, heaven than... forbid, what? No. This is the root of, of so much of our opioid epidemic is we're treating psychic pain. We're treating trauma, childhood adverse experiences. And we don't, we're not stepping up as doctors because we can't. And, that, and you don't think that causes moral injury? Where you go, oh, Huge. this guy's now <laughs> addicted Huge. Yeah. to the Percocet that I started for the, the, the headache that was caused by the fact that this person had been abused all their childhood and now is getting a trigger and it's causing this real symptom of real pain. Right. And then they're going to the ER and treated like a criminal when they're addicted or dependent on the Percocet. And that, and that gets to Jason Robert Beck's uh, question. He's a supporter as well of the show. Speaking of cost, the DPC model uh, allows for excellent primary care. Any thoughts on making the model work to include preventative services like nutrition, movement, social determinants? Well, it automatically includes that. You know, when we have a new patient come in, we're asking about all those health-related factors, the social determinants. That's part of getting to know the patient. Um, it, it automatically includes that, but I think what you're getting at is like with Dr. Bender's case, I think he mentioned, mm -hmm. They had a whole team where they had a dietitian. Yeah. You know, most direct primary care practices don't include that entire team because the direct primary care doc is just doing that. I mean, if you have an hour visit, I mean, what are you gonna talk about for an hour? You're getting into all those social aspects. Uh, so. that, that's spot on. That's, in our service, our health coaches were really big on the social determinants. They would go to people's houses, they'd go running with them, they would look through their shopping list to see what, what, they're, or, what they're buying and go, you know what, you, you, can't, you cannot eat Campbell's soup if you have congestive heart failure. It has a butt ton of sodium, but patients yeah. don't know this. No, They're, they're thinking it was salt, but th I'm not adding salt to my stuff. Uh, Mike Lubin from uh, Hint Health said, hey everyone, exciting news, Hint Health is launching a low cost, high value wraparound insurance plans that our DPC doctors can offer in combination with their DPC memberships that patients can buy directly from their DPC doctors. No more need for expensive insurance that conflicts with direct primary care. Stay tuned. That's exciting. Yeah, that's coming right off of the cost sharing model. You know, there's these four cost sharing plans out there, um, but there's, the, again, new technology, new companies emerging to, to cater to this model where, okay, now you can have a true wraparound insurance product. Amazing. That, that's low cost because it only covers catastrophe. Supporter Susan Grant says, uh, do you treat families and children? We talked about that. Absolutely, birth to death. Birth to death. Right. So cradle to grave. And the vaccines are the only challenge there because in a direct primary care practice, I, can, I can't really order bulk vaccines and administer them and include them in the monthly membership. So I do encourage my patients who, to go to the health department for their vaccines, yes. and the health department's a great place to get vaccines. You, so, oh, I'm so glad you brought that up because when we were running Turntable, here I am advocating vaccines everywhere I go. We can't bill for vaccines, right. which means we don't get reimbursed for them. So if we, like you said, if you order a butt ton of them and they go bad, you're kind of out of luck. So we would send people to the health department, but then exactly. for flu shots, you know what we did? We just bought a butt ton of flu shots and we gave them out at a loss to us because we believed in that. And if there was a, a kid who needed a particular vaccine, we were like, you know what, let's just order it and suck it up because we care about our damn patients. Now we shouldn't have to do that. And look, the local pharmacies have pretty much taken that over anyway. That's like true. Most of my patients can get a flu shot at a local pharmacy, the, so that's not a problem. The problem was the kids. So the local pharmacies weren't doing kids. And so yeah. we ended up doing that for them. But uh, see, and again, because we're passionate about vaccines, we know what works in medicine. Correct. There's a lot that doesn't work. And, and I digress, but you know, the birth to death thing, you know, I do take care of kids from birth to death, but it seems that many parents will have their child see a pediatrician until they're two, mm -hmm. because, so they can get the bulk of the vaccines kind of covered that way. And so I, I do mm -hmm. tend to see more children after age two. We did that as well. Because yeah. the infants, because there's so many vaccinations, it's just easier to have the pediatrician there, yeah. the fee-for-service standard pediatrician. Now, here's the thing. What if that pediatrician were DPC? 
it would work perfectly. Work perfectly. Then we would all sort of bulk purchase, bulk purchase the, vaccine the vaccine so we could all offer them. You know, and but then, but then, Eric, how will the anti-vaxxers accuse us of shilling vaccines for money if we make no money on the vaccines? What will happen um, to them, Eric? Will they cry themselves to sleep because they can't attack us anymore? I prefer not to think about that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you really are oh. burnout immune. <laughs> if you think about that for a minute, you'll burn ah, out. Speaking of burnout, yeah. I did want to come back to the physician burnout piece mm. because I don't know if that's the fourth aim or I think I f we might even be up to the fifth aim, We're but like it doesn't 12, matter. Yeah. Direct primary care takes care of them all. It's like that physician burnout piece is critical. and. I find that even among the, direct, the docs who are doing direct primary care, if you ask them, they'll tell you, oh yeah, it's great, I love it. But deep down, they're just as stressed about how they're gonna stay open. Yeah. And is this gonna work? Yeah, yeah, so we were, yeah. A lot of them feel just as stressed as they did when they were fee-for-service docs, but yeah. in a different way. Yeah. And again, that's where the whole network piece comes together. Because as these networks form, doctors are gonna be able to confidently go into direct primary care at a low overhead and, and not be afraid of having to stay on Medicare so they can work in ERs to pay the bills. Dude. So everybody wins with this, Dude. everybody. So here's the thing, this is why I'm, I agreed again, I don't take sponsorships lightly anymore and I start hurling feces at sponsors I don't <laughs> like. I've, I almost did it recently. Um, Hint and others like yourself are trying to make it easier, safer, more comfortable and more stress-free for people to spin up a DPC practice. I wish, now Hint was there when we did our thing, we would not have lasted a year without Hint. We went three when our insurance company went out of business, but even the insurance company, we were using Hint to, to, to do the, the membership model billing for them. Having those pieces takes that stuff off our plate because doctors it are risk-averse. They, yes. they like to stress about their patients. They don't like to stress about everything else. So that's what I think, I'm so glad you mentioned this because for me, that's what was transformative about what people like Hint are doing and others. Others in the, sp in the DPC space that are building these networks and are trying to do that, you know, Dave Chase at Rosetta and others. Right. They're all, we're all together in this ship. We believe in it profoundly. It's almost like a religious cause for us because we know it can save medicine. It can we don't, save I know. It. And as I listened to Dr. Bender yesterday, I was struck too by the 3% of docs in the country doing direct primary care. That shocked me, I guess because I'm in this space. I feel, like, I feel like it's actually on the steep part of the growth curve. Yeah, I like, think you're you right. Know. So, um, and I lost my train of thought there. Um, oh, we were talking about uh, the, the kind of uh, taking, the, taking the pain and the stress off and having it be an exponential growth. And, you know, and the comments here are interesting, you know, it, they really, People are, are really feeling this idea that we could save medicine. But here's a question for you. How about our specialists, our surgeons, our you know, dermatologists, people who are also struggling? Uh, these, it's not like just this, like hurt is a primary care thing. It's across the board. Yeah. Well, what do you think about this? Uh, the, they, they are not able to do a direct approach because they have higher cost services they're providing, but they are happy to provide cash pricing at a rate that they consider fair and reasonable for their service, not to have to send that claim to the insurance company. Right. So in a community where direct primary care doctors practice, they, we reach out to a specialist, yeah. let them know what we're doing. We want to build a network of specialists for our cash pay patients. What is the lowest amount that you consider fair and reasonable that you will accept from our patients? And they go and they, they either use their insurance or if they do have um, only truly catastrophic, they just pay cash fees. The right. specialists are very happy to take cash fees for the same reason we're happy to not bill insurance. Right, it's less administrative overhead. They know they're gonna get paid on time, X, Y, and Z. And in the model where this all comes direct to employer, the, employer, the employers it. are gonna be paying the specialists directly. It's a, see, to yeah. me, employer-mediated uh, healthcare like this is the, is the answer in the DPC space because you know, you know the employer is going to love the fact that you're taking care of their patients. Their patients feel their patients, their employees, their teammates get amazing care. And then if they have to go to a specialist, the employer pays for it without question because they trust you to be the shepherd of that care. You're gonna right. pick. We used to have something we called our good guys network. It was a specialist that didn't suck. And in a town <laughs> like Las Vegas, that's a struggle. 
That's a list I want to be on. I, right? Yeah. I, I would like, if I, as, as a hospitalist, I'd like to be on the list that, yeah. that uh, the, the DPC docs choose to take care of their patients in the hospital. Do you round in the hospital at all, or do you hand it off? I don't. I, I stopped doing that years ago, even before I went into direct, pr direct primary care, because of the hospitalist movement. I mean, right. it, back in 03, 04, it got to the point where the, our, our value was recognized as being mostly in the office seeing our patients. Right. And the hospitals really wanted the hospitalists that are there 24-7 taking care. So, you know. Now, the downside of that, and as a hospitalist, I'll say this, the reason we were great hospitalists, and I'm going to toot my own horn in my organization, Palo Alto Medical Foundation, is we were all on the same team with the primary care docs. So you're a PCP, I'm a hospitalist, I would go spend a half day in clinic hanging out with you. They made us do that, just so we knew each other. Wow. And we hated it as hospitalists, because we're like, I don't wanna do clinic, but we would go and we knew everybody. So when Jay Schlumberger admits a patient calls me, I'm like, I'm gonna take real good care of him, Jay, because I know what you like and I know, I know you care about your patients. Yeah. And that, that relationship transcended the fact that now there's a different doctor in the hospital. So when that patient came to the ER and I was coming down to admit, I'd say, hey, I'm Dr. Demania. I'm, I work with Jay Schlumberger. He and I are buddies. We're in the same organization. I represent him. My job is to keep you safe and sound through your hospitalization, take good care of you, and to communicate with him. Hope that's okay. Hand him the card that has the same name of the organization. Imagine you're in a DPC network and you have hospitalists in that network. I know. Transform medicine. It, it is transformative. And I did complete my earlier thought because when you mentioned Dave Chase and the Health Rosetta, yeah. you know, the development of this employer space is so critical because without engaging employers, you're going to have a lot of individual direct primary care docs around the country opening up and trying to be viable. Mm. And it won't really become an ex this expansive movement. It'll be kind of an undercurrent and, mm. and it'll take off, but the way that it becomes the way of giving healthcare to the country is through the engagement of employers. And mm. what Dave Chase has done at Health Rosetta, a critical piece of this, because it's the, it's the insurance brokers, and I, I recently understand that term is derogatory, the health benefits advisors that put these plans together for companies they are heavily incentivized to keep as many employers as possible under the old system because it's so complex and the costs are fixed and all their profits are built into the old system. So these brokers don't want to help us I've noticed identify that. employers to convert them to the new strategy. So Dave Chase at, at, at the, um, in the Health Rosetta, they're actually training brokers yeah. to be certified to put together benefits packages like this, where you have direct primary care at the base, and then you have um, a TPA or you know, the stop loss over, over top of it, like you mentioned earlier, to pair it all together so every company can control their costs mm. and they can give a, a, a benefit to their employees. And that's how this becomes a Health 3.0. It's 3 through the employers. All right, I think uh, this is... Oh, go ahead, go ahead. But it is happening, that's my point. It's like, it, that's how it's gonna really take off, but it's already happening. Every, every single hater on this show, okay? I don't see it in the comments, but I've heard it before. You talk and talk and talk about Health 3.0. It's never gonna happen, you're deluded. My wife asked me if I was deluded early on in this. Do you think you could be delusional? Because this thing sounds like it's never gonna happen. And it's happening. It's not just happening. It's snowballing. Because from the ground up, we're not waiting for them to no, figure no, no, it no. out at the top. You we're fixing it at the bottom. You wait for them, we're done. Yeah. We're going to have a single payer plan that's going to pay for everything that's broken. It's going to bankrupt the country and it's going to destroy medicine. Well, you know, the desktop computer, that was never going to work. That was never going to take off. It's like, oh, you can't have desktop People computers. People said the iPhone was going to fail. That was total garbage. Uh, too expensive, too whatever. Dude, this is the future of medicine. It's disruptive and, innovation at its finest. stop. Disruptive innovation. Fight the frickin' power. It takes us, as a, us meaning everyone in healthcare on the front lines, to lead, working with our leadership administrators and that kind of thing. Got to incorporate them. Got to subvert the legacy players. Yeah. It, you, you, otherwise, it, you're just going to go down, but we're going to win, and we're going to win big, and it's going to transform care for not just for us, but for our kids, for our colleagues, for future kids who are like, should I go to med school? I tell them, hell yeah, because when you finish, you're going to be working in a system that is so true to the reasons you went in that you won't even believe it. And don't listen to anybody who says don't go into medicine, because we know on the front edge of this change that it's going to happen. 
there it, it is it is happening it is going to happen and there's going to be a graveyard of benefits advisors who they stayed too, they stayed true to the old system too long and then it was too late i mean we have status quo benefits and we have next generation benefits <laughs> and this next generation way of doing all this it is 3.0 and i feel like i need to say you know i'm late in the game to this i'm just a guy down in tampa who's doing this in Tampa Bay, I got to give credit. I don't want to stand here like I'm some innovator myself. I got to give credit to the guys like Clint Flanagan out at Nextera. Oh, Clint's an awesome you know, guy. At yeah. I Iora Health and now Joel Love Besmer this. at Strata. I mean, mm -hmm. these are guys that have been doing it. They are the true innovators. I'm thankful to be in a position where I can take this and, and run with it, you know, in my small community. But that's what we need. We need groups of doctors in every major met metropolitan area in the country just setting up a little local network and then we all become affiliates of each other. So if you have a company with employees in Tampa and Boulder, no problem. There's already a network in Boulder. You know, Dr. Mm -hmm. Flanagan and his team will take care of your employees in Boulder. And so that's where... It, and then when everything, when all the costs come under control, then we can have true catastrophic Medicare for all. Catastrophic Medicare for all. And we're done. And we're that we're, we're not we're not we know we're not just Europe we're freaking better than Europe by an order of magnitude because American innovation capitalism entrepreneurship and freedom combined with the egalitarian vision of everybody gets care we don't leave anyone behind right and we can afford it that will be health care the way it used to be but better but better, but, better, but with all the 2.0 components. All, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's just the like it's is one and two, right. It. Take best of one, best of two, transcend it, you get three. And I think that's a great way to end this show. Man, Eric Crawl, what a freaking pleasure. You got me all fired So up. much fun. I got goosebumps. Oh, me too. And, yeah. uh, and th that, that only happens when I'm about to have diarrhea. Oh. Um, <laughs> so that means, but if I had a direct primary care doc, I would get that Lamotol right now, which yeah. I would grind up and snort because it is a partial opioid agonist. On that note, I want to thank our... <laughs> Can't I top that. Thank, they're laughing in the back. I want to thank our, um, our sponsor, Hint. Seriously. Yes. They and, and Me Zach, too. They, aren't they <laughs> tremendous? Yes. And I don't say this because I'm shilling for them because it wasn't in any contract that I had to say anything about them in this episode. I am saying it because I believe it, that I think companies like that that are willing to take a risk, how risky is it to bet your entire company on a movement that is only starting. That is the right. riskiest thing you can do. And yet, not only have they done it, they outlasted us as Turntable. We started at the same time. <laughs> they are crushing it. And yes. they're going to catalyze this movement. So I want to thank them. Go to hint.com if you want to learn about DPC, learn from their specialists. Uh, it's a great consortium of thought leadership, actual tools, and you don't have to pay anything to do it. So on that note, I want to thank the ZPAC. Please hit like, hit, hit share, because we got to get Dr. Crawl's vision out there. And uh, subscribe if you love the work we do, because that will keep us sponsor-free, except for sponsors we like. And we out. Thank you, Dr. Carl. Thank you.